Uh, thank you for being here. We wanted to uh, discuss the Kirsten Hatfield case today with you. Along with me is Special Agent in Charge of the FBI Oklahoma City Office, Scott Cruz, and also OSBI Director Stan Florence to my left. And what I'd like to do is uh, give a quick synopsis of how we got here today and then turn the uh, conference over to Special Agent in Charge Cruz and let him speak and then also turn over the conference to OSBI Director Stan Florence and then we'll take questions at the end if that's okay. Well, as you know, we've, we've made an arrest of Anthony Palma in reference to the uh, disappearance of Kirsten Hatfield. The arrest took place yesterday. As a result, this case has been investigated for the last 18 years since May of 1997. We've done that with uh, great assistance from the FBI and also from OSBI and from the Oklahoma County District Attorney's Office, more specifically, David Prater. I wanna walk you back in, in May, I'm sorry, in June of 2014, the case was reassigned to Daryl Miller, one of our investigators. At that point, we met with the FBI, Agent Nate Furr, who works for Mr. Case, and we started speaking with him in reference to this investigation. And at that point, we decided to review all the evidence in the case. And what we learned from our review is that some evidence had not been submitted for analysis, which included cigarette butts, a syringe, a beer bottle, and what we also knew from the original analysis of the blood that was found in Kirsten Hatfield's panties and also the blood on the window seal outside her bedroom window is that there were specific genetic profiles that were similar in nature. nature. However, the chemist could not say they were both one and the same. So when we looked at the evidence again, we resubmitted that evidence to OSBI. And as a result of that, in July of this year, we received a report from OSBI that indicated the blood sample from Kirsten Hatfield's panties and also the blood on the window seal matched Anthony Palma and the match was one in 293 sextillion. At that point, we started formulating a game plan with the FBI and with the Oklahoma County District Attorney's Office how we proceed. We received some PIN numbers for some cell phones. We were going to apply for a wiretap. We also applied for a search warrant of the residents. We were doing some GPS and some surveillance of Mr. Palma. And that this weekend, we accelerated that case to go ahead and contact Mr. Palma, who was working in Norman at Lang Thunderbird as a groundskeeper. At that point, when we made contact with Mr. Palma, we brought him to our station on his own accord. We had an interview with him. At that point, we arrested him for murder in the first degree and also kidnapping of Kirsten Hatfield. There is no bond set for Mr. Palma, he is currently still here at our jail facility. What I want to focus on is that it's, it's dynamic that how we got the buckle swab from Anthony Palma is the fact that the investigator and the FBI realized that we wanted to re-interview every male that was associated with this case. Upon the re-interview of these males that were associated with the case, we asked for a sample buckle swab from each and they all consented. We sent off several samples to OSBI with no results. When we sent off Anthony Palma's buckle swab, we were able to get a positive ID on his DNA, which is directly related to the DNA that was found in Kirsten Hatfield's underwear and also on the windowsill. And as a result, led to this arrest that we're speaking about today. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Special Agent in Charge, Scott Cruz. Thanks, Chief. I'll be very brief. I just wanted to say that this is a significant milestone in this investigation after many years. Uh, and uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be done, as we've discussed here today. But uh, this has been a great team effort, and uh, we're going to stand beside Chief Klaibs through the end on this and uh, see this through. So thank you. Director Florence. Uh, Chief Klaibs did a good job in articulating the details of the case and what's progressed over the last several years. The one thing I wanted to do is uh, to highlight two things. One is we appreciate the opportunity to work with local agencies like the Midwest City Police Department and federal agencies like the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, it's that collaborative effort that ultimately brings success to cases like this. The second thing I want to talk about just briefly is the advancements that we've seen in DNA. Uh, clearly with uh, this case as an example, and this is one of many cases that we see are now being solved through the the, the process of DNA analysis, we're realizing more and more as technology advances, as we see the ability to, to, to conduct more sensitive testing, 
were able to, uh, to zero in more clearly on potentially uh, individuals who are involved in crimes and I think also just importantly to take away a focus on those who are not involved in, in these types of crimes. So it's clearly an important part of, of criminal investigations and uh, we're very thankful that we can have a part in this, in this investigation. Uh, we appreciate uh, uh, your participation in this and, and allowing this opportunity to, to highlight this case and the work that's been done to ultimately bring this to a conclusion. I want to reiterate, reiterate again how important this case is to us as Midwest City Police Department. We have worked continuously on this case for 18 years. We're emotionally invested in this case. We wanted to bring it to a logical conclusion. This is the initial stage of this case. We have a lot more work to do in reference to this case. Uh, I can't tell you how proud I am of my investigators uh, for the fact that in my lab director who made the decision along with the FBI to go back out and re-interview the male suspects associated with this case, also to get buckle swabs from each individual, which in turn led to the DNA sample that was matched with the blood that was found at the scene the day that Kirsten Hatfield was taken from her home. With that said, if you have any questions, we'll be glad to entertain those questions, and then they can either be to myself or to either one of these gentlemen. Yes, Dave. Yes, that's what I is referencing. There was also a beer bottle and also a bucket that was not tested. And can you tell us why that wasn't tested? I can't. How many uh, male subjects were we interviewed? I know at least 10 were. I'm not sure how many passed that point. Steve, would you be surprised if Paula actually submitted to the DNA test, considering what the results are? You know, I don't know how to speculate on that. I, I'm, I'm just glad that he did which resulted in his arrest in reference to this case. Can you talk about yesterday your investigators were on the scene on Jet Drive. What was taken from the home? Was it that evidence that was not? Or were you just looking for domain, like receipts, electric, like what was taken by any chance? We're not going to comment on the search one. It's still ongoing at this time and probably will go on through tomorrow also. Have you located Kirsten? We have not. I have no comment in reference to that. Are you looking at Mr. Palma in connection with any other um, missing persons cases? We certainly will look at that. Will there be digging going on, or are you just specifically looking inside the home? I have no comment on that. Do you have any comment in regards to the dig that happened down in Jones that was related to this case? It was related to this case. We received information that she possibly might be at that location. Obviously, our dig was not successful at that point, but I don't want to go into any more information since it was unsuccessful. We've had surveillance in place for some time. Um, when you got the DNA results in July after the swap, did you keep an eye on him? Were you worried that he might be a flight risk, knowing that you had his DNA now? We've had him under surveillance. We, we felt very confident with our game plan. Uh, we did accelerate it uh, this weekend for unspecified reasons, which I'm not going to speak about today. but. As a result, that's why he is in custody today. But our plans were to go ahead and obtain a wiretap, which we've been working on for some time. Of course, you know it goes to the Attorney General's office, has to be reviewed by the DA's office. It takes some time, and we opted to go ahead and, and not do that process. Do you know why the blood evidence did not get the DNA? Let me refer that to Director Florence. Did you hear the question? Uh, let the airplane go past yeah. first. Try again. Well, there's there's two there's two parts to that, that to address. One is the testing that was done in those days in the in the late 1990s is quite a bit different than today. As I mentioned earlier, the sensitivity of those tests is, uh, is, is a lot more precise nowadays. And so that makes it much more clear in that regard. Uh, in terms of CODIS, CODIS did exist in those days. However, even up until recently, uh, our, our suspect, our defendant in this case, was not entered into CODIS because there's no qualifying offense that would have put him in the CODIS. So because of that, there was no known sample to compare either in CODIS 
or until finally a known sample came to us that ended up being the suspect. What is it finally when the man in jail right now is cooperating? That's up to you. We have no comment on that. No, the hit was scientific in nature. It had nothing to do with any stories he said or did not say. But is that why you put him in the system, though? Because he's not in the. He's currently not in the system. He's not a convicted sex offender, or, or nor does he have any other qualifying offenses at this point. Once a person's convicted under certain Oklahoma statutes, then they qualify to be placed in CODIS. It was a voluntary swap that ended up. Correct. Yeah. Yes. They had interviewed him originally in 1997 on two different occasions. But it never stood out amongst any of the other possible Not at that point, no. Is there a particular reason why I guess you guys are still keeping him here as opposed to moving him to county? We're still interviewing him. Are you trying to make a deal with the father? We wouldn't make that kind of agreement. Do you have an attorney at this point? No comment. The only thing I want to close with is we're very grateful for the cooperation with the FBI and OSBI and the DA's office again. As I said, we've worked on this case for 18 years. We've never let this case down. We want to come to a logical conclusion, but we still have a lot more to do. And we're not saying that there could not be additional suspects in this case. We don't know at this point, but we're working through those things and uh, just wanted to get, bring you up to date as where we are today. Actually, I'd like to refer to uh, Mr. Cruz in reference to that because he's done some of those profiling and worked sexual cases. Could you, re could you please repeat that question? Uh, in the affidavit, it states that uh, oftentimes sexual predators will remain at a location kind of to guard the evidence or anything like that. Could you elaborate on that, please? I'm not, I'm not really sure that I could, uh, um, I'm qualified to answer that question. I, I can say this that uh, investigations such as this are very complicated. Oftentimes the evidence is very uh, subtle and hard to uh, uh, collect and, and, and analyze. Um, in this particular investigation here, the subject um, who has been arrested lived close by and uh, I can't speculate as to why or what he would be doing with regards to watching or paying attention to the, the property. I just couldn't. There were. There were. He's married. He, he's married and has, has children, yes. Wasn't in 1997? No, he was, he was single at that time, yes. So how long have you lived with that? Since, Since 1997. 1997. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised he never moved out of state? I couldn't speculate on that. I mean, a lot of people stay in their homes forever for a long time. I don't know why he hasn't moved, but he's been here since that time. Well, it's for a variety of reasons. For example, people retire, they go on to different assignments. So anytime someone changed with the, with the, the case, we would always coordinate with the FBI on the case and make sure that we, we were coordinating with our efforts. Uh, in this particular example, we had a, a lab director who decided to make a decision to pull the evidence back out again, do some reanalysis, and then also made the decision our investigators did along with the FBI to go out and re-interview the male subjects mentioned in this investigation. And as a result of that, they received the buckle swabs, which in turn led us to the DNA hit. So really, to give you what I think is analysis, it's, it's proverbial needle in the haystack is how fortunate lucky we were in this case. Um, my name is Chris Hazen, and this is my wife Shannon, and Kirsten was Shannon's daughter. And um, we got married two years after her abduction. And Shannon has another daughter named Faith. And I've always felt like that if Kirsten would have been here, I would have adopted her too. And so I consider her my daughter too. And we wanted to um, just tell you all that our family is hopeful. 
but we're very tired and we want to take this opportunity to let all of our family and friends know that we're okay and please continue to pray for us. And I wanted to say thank you to all the police uh, and law enforcement that helped, uh, that's helping solve this case because this has just been a, a terrible nightmare to my wife ever since it happened. And um, thank you guys.